Hello, good evening, everyone. Okay, so um, welcome okay, to today's class. All right, so um, uh, so there's a few updates. Um, I have uh, uploaded the material for the uh, assignment one as well as the term paper. All right, uh, so I will be talking about that uh, later on. Okay, so today the plan is we will finish up lecture seven and eight. All right, so seven is the data part and eight is the control. All right, so they're actually quite linked, okay, very closely linked. So you finish up both of them first, all right, and uh, that itself uh, I will complete the entire first half of uh, our module. All right, that means we cover the entire assembly language and MIPS architecture design. All right, and from there we can uh, go on to tutorial two questions and the discussion on the assignment and the inter paper. All right, so that is uh, the plan I have for today. All right, uh, so I think we should have uh, enough time to cover everything. Okay, so let me uh, get started. All right, um, with the uh, with the class. Okay, so I'll just do a quick uh, review first. Okay, on the things that we discussed uh, last week. So just to refresh your memory before we continue. Okay, so in the last uh, week's lecture, all right, basically we were uh, starting to look at the internal structure of the MIPS processor. Okay. So we saw that, um, okay, we saw that basically uh, every processor, when it, when it goes about trying to execute the instruction, it goes through a few different stages. And these are the five main stages that we saw, okay, the fetch. The code, uh, ALU, memory, and register, right? All right. So the first one we saw was the fetching. That means we fetch the instruction from the memory. All right. And by default, uh, every instruction is four bytes away. Okay. So the hardware block, okay, within the processor itself will automatically increment by four after fetching each instruction. Okay. So that is uh, what we saw. Okay, and we also discussed the concept of the clock. So everything is tied to the clock. Okay, so when a new clock comes in, that is when everything on the input gets passed to the block and the processing happens. And, and the output must be available, okay, and ready at the output pins uh, before the next clock uh, edge arrives. All right, so that is basically the idea behind a clocking based system. All right, so all um, sort of uh, processor-based systems, okay, have a clock, all right, and uh, everything has to happen according to the clock cycle. All right, so then we moved on to the decode stage, all right, so we were looking at the first part of the decode stage, which is the register file, okay, so we know that uh, when we fetch an instruction, all right, like this, R type instruction, okay, what we saw is there are three registers, Two of them are the source registers, RS and RT. And we take the information from these two registers and we perform the operation. And the result is stored back in a destination register. Right? So we need to specify three registers. Two for reading, okay, and one for writing. So the two reading and one for writing. Okay, so the way in which the instruction format is. Okay, so if you remember the instruction format for R type. Is the opcode here, okay, followed by RS, okay, RT, and then RD, okay, followed by the shift amount and then the function field. Okay, so basically what we need to do is the 32 bits, the instruction, okay, the bits that correspond to RS, RT, and RD will automatically be uh, wired, hardwired to the bits of the read register or in the register file. Okay, so when that happens, you, you are immediately telling the register file that I want to read the contents from, for example, this register 9, from this register 10, and that data will appear here and here. Okay, so that data will appear here and here. And then, then of course, then you go to the next stage later on. All right, so this is what we saw. In terms of, okay, so, so that was why we initially started the R type of instruction, the R format instructions. 
And then we said, okay, now our processor must also support I type instructions. Okay, so for I type instructions, okay, uh, this is an example, correct? And then we saw that the, the um, instruction is opcode, okay, RS, RT, and then 16 bit of immediate value. All right, so in this case, we want to read from one register RS, okay? The destination is actually RT, and then the lower 16 bits is immediate. Okay, so we have to remember that in the previous case, okay, for R type instruction, the bits 15 to 11, that means these bits were actually referring to another register, right? The RD register. Okay, but if we stick to this earlier design, then what happened? That means those bits are specifying the register that I want to write to. Okay, but actually in this ITAR instruction, the register that I want to write to is specified in this location. Okay, in this location. All right, so how do we solve this? All right, because now the format of the instruction is, is different. So the bits that correspond to the write register are no longer the 15 to 11, but 20 to 16. All right. So in order to solve this, okay, what we need to do is we need to introduce this component called the multiplexer, okay, which we saw last week. So the multiplexer is again, just a simple switch. Okay, at any point of time, you can have many, many inputs and then you decide uh, using a selector, which of the inputs will go to the output. All right, so this multiplexer will decide whether the uh, bits 20 to 16 will go to the right register bits or the bits 15 to 11 will go to the right register bits. Okay, so that is basically what you uh, can decide using this multiplexer. All right, so all these multiplexers along the way that we're going to add have some form of a control signal. So this is what you call the selector. Okay, so later on, okay, in the next talk, uh, chapter, we will look at how to configure these selector bits correctly. But for now, we just take it that there is a multiplexer, and by choosing the correct value for the selector, the, the, the uh, correct data will pass through to the next stage and so on. Okay, so these are the things we saw. Okay, in terms of the reading of the data, okay. Um, we know that for our add instruction, okay, if I go back to the add instruction here, the RTA add instruction, okay, so I know that the data that comes out of RS, so this is the data come out of RS, this is the data come out of RT. And both of this data is the one that I want to perform the add operation. Okay, so both of this can go directly to the next stage. That means the ALU stage to do the add operation. But in an ITAC instruction like this, okay, we know that the sec only one of the data is from the register, which is this. Okay, this is the content of register 22. Okay, the other data is actually the immediate value. Okay, the immediate value. So I need to be able to make sure that the next stage also gets the correct data to do the operation. Okay, so in R type, the data must be from the two registers. In I type, the data is one register data, the other is the immediate value. Okay, and to solve that, we will now introduce another multiplexer. Okay, so you will see that multiplexer is actually very useful because they help us decide which way uh, the data is supposed to flow depending on the instruction you're executing or some condition that you are checking for and so on. All right, so that is basically what this second multiplexer is here for. It is to decide who goes to the next stage. All right, that means if it's an R type instruction, it will be both the data. But if it's an I type instruction like this, then one of it is the register, the other is the immediate value. 
Okay, so for the emitter value, okay, we know it is 16 bits. We need to sign extend to 32 bits before passing over. Okay, so why do I need to do a sign extension? Because all my operations are 32 bit. Okay, that means all the data I deal with have to be 32 bit. All right, so the 16 bit data, there is a hardware block here that will sign extend. All right, 32 bits, and then we'll pass to the uh, multiplexer before I deciding who passes through. All right, now let's look at the same thing for the load word instruction. For the load word instruction, RS is over here, so I'll get a value of uh, uh, whatever value is in the RS register here, which is 22. Okay, so that data will come out here. And this is the immediate value, the negative 50. Okay, so the content of register 22 will come out here. The immediate value, which is negative 50, will get sign extended. Okay, so the value is still the same. Only thing is the sign extension means that from 16 bits, I extend to 32 bits. Okay, but the value is the same. All right, so in this example, the data that I want to do the addition, okay, because what I need to do is I need to do addition, correct? The RS value plus the immediate value, and this is pointing to the address where the data is stored. I want to take this data and put it into the register 21. So this addition operation, okay, to get the final address is the next stage. All right, so in this case, one of the addition operands is the RS register, which is this. The second is the immediate value. So this immediate value is the one that will be selected to pass through the negative 50. Okay. So the current design that we have here already supports the load word instruction. Okay, so we don't need to modify anything. Okay, how about a branch instruction? So a brand instruction is basically comparing two registers, uh, the content of two registers. So in this case, okay, uh, RS and RT, okay. So one of it, both of them will come, okay, here. So the value nine will come here, the value zero will come here, and the content of register nine will come here, the content of register zero will come here. Okay. So in this. Uh, example, the next step will be to take this data and pass it through. Okay, so the current architecture that you see here also supports the branch instruction. You don't need to modify anything. Okay, so of course, now you have this tree over here. This tree is basically, if you remember that the uh, the how the BEQ works, this tree refers to the three lines of code. Okay, three lines of code uh, that I need to branch to, or three lines of code away that I need to branch to if the check is true. Okay, the result is true. So this tree, I need to handle it. Okay, because this tree is currently over here. This is giving me a value of the tree. So I need to handle it in another way. All right, so that one we will look at it in a while. Okay, so I need to calculate the branch outcome, okay, and the target. All right, so this one we will handle it in the next stage. Okay, so this is basically where we stopped, okay, last week where we looked at this whole design that we currently have. Okay, so the decode stage of the processor is basically what you see over here, okay? And this current design already supports the different instructions that we want to have. The R type, the I type, the memory access, the branch, everything is well supported with this uh, architecture for the decode stage. Okay, so now let's go on to the next stage. Okay, the next stage is the ALU stage. Okay, so what is ALU? ALU basically stands for arithmetic and logic unit. Okay, it's basically the execution. Okay, that means the, the number crunching to say it. All right, so all the arithmetic operations, logical operations, shifting, everything is done, okay, in this stage. All right, so I need to make sure that the ALU receives the correct data to do the execution. Okay, that is why 
over here we have all these multiplexes and so on just to make sure that the correct data is transferred over to the uh, ALU stage. Okay, so in the ALU stage, basically you have two inputs being passed in. All right, so these two inputs again could be register and register. Okay, could be register and uh, immediate value. Okay, depending on the type of instruction we are dealing with. Okay, so in terms of the arithmetic and logical unit, basically there are two inputs. Okay, the two inputs are the A and B, which are the two 32 bit values. All right, and then there are two results. Okay, one is the main result, which is the A of B. So this op could be anything that you are telling it to do. All right, and how do you tell the ALU what to do? You have to use some control bits. Okay, so again, this we will look at it in the next chapter. But basically, just like how we decide uh, the control of the multiplexer, all right? Whether the data at the first wire goes through or the second wire goes through, so we will also be have to uh, have some control signals being sent to the ALU unit to tell the ALU exactly what operation to do. Okay, is this supposed to do an add operation? Is this supposed to do a shift operation or anything like that? Okay, so those are the ALU control bits. Okay, so this is just to show you how, uh, an idea of how, what, what we mean. So for example, if this four bits, so this four bits over here, if let's say it is all zeros, then the ALU will perform an add operation. Okay, if it is zero, zero, one, zero, then it will perform an add operation and so on. Okay, so you will use these four bits to decide on the actual operation that it is supposed to carry out. Okay, so let's look at the uh, the next stage. Okay, so for this uh, add instruction, all right. So we know that what I have here is nine, ten, and eight. Okay, so the value nine comes here, the value ten comes here, the value eight comes here. Okay, so these are the registers that I want to read and write to. Okay, so the content of register 9 will come here, the content of register 10 will come here. All right, so that is the output of the register file. And the multiplexer here will ensure that, in this case, the data from the read data 2 is the one that goes over to the ALU. Okay, and at the same time, your ALU control will have the correct uh, bits. Okay, to say it is an add operation. Okay, so how do we know how to set the correct control? Because the, the control unit, if you look in the next chapter, actually makes use of the opcode and the function field. Okay, so using the opcode and the function field, it will be able to decode and tell the processor the specific operation that it is supposed to carry out. Okay, similarly, at the same time, all right, you also have a branch uh, instruction that you want to support, correct? So, for example, this instruction BEQ, okay, so what you will do is you will check whether the content of register 9 and register 0 are equal. And this is a second output of the ALU. So, you can see the ALU has two outputs one is the result, the other is the E0. So, this E0 is basically to check whether the uh, content of the two registers 9 and 10 in this case are they the same okay so if they are the same okay that means they're equal then the output is a one all right and we will use that in the next stage okay to um, sort of change the uh, branch address Okay, or to change the address of the program counter to know that it is now not the next instruction, but it's some other instruction. Okay, so in order for me to know the exact address, I also need to take into account this value, right? And use that to calculate the actual branch address, which is called the branch target address. Okay, 
And how can I do that? That is done using this block over here. Okay, so what is this block over here? All right, so what we know is, we know that by default, this program counter is incremented by four. Okay, why incremented by four? Because the every instruction is four bytes and by default, we assume that you're going sequentially. That means you're going line by line. Okay, so what you have here is PC plus four. Okay, readily available to fetch the next instruction. Okay, that is the default. So it's always there. But at the same time, okay, at the same time, we also know that we could be fetching a branch instruction like this. Okay, we could be trying to execute a branch instruction. So if I'm executing a branch instruction and this branch check is true, that means S0 is equal to S1, then the next instruction that I execute is not in PC plus four. It is three lines away from that. Right? It's three lines away from PC plus four. So how do I do this? What I need to do is this tree, where is it? This tree is actually the value over here. Okay, and this tree, what I will do is, if you see the pathway over here, I'm actually passing it over to this unique caller, left shift by two. Okay, so a left shift by two is what? Left shift by two is equivalent to multiply by four. Okay, so if you uh, look back at your earlier notes, we said that whenever you do a left shift, okay, it's considered multiply by two. Okay, left shift by one, multiply by two. And if I do a right shift by one is divided by two. Okay, so every time I shift left by one bit is equivalent to another multiply by two to the power of one to the power of two or so on. So when I left shift by two bits, it is equivalent to multiply by four. Okay, why multiply by four? Because each line, so this tree is actually referring to three lines of code. Okay, but each line of code is 32 bit. That means it's four bytes. Okay, each line of code is 32 bits, it's four bytes. All right, so I need to make sure that I need to multiply by four so I know the exact number of bytes to offset. Okay, so in this case, once the three comes here and left shift by two, it will become a 12 over here. All right, so now what do you see? This is another adder, just like this. Okay, we say PC plus four comes out here. So in this adder, okay, so the PC plus four also comes here. And what is available over here is PC plus four plus my 12. Okay, so now what you see is you have two addresses on standby. Okay, two addresses on standby. One is the PC plus four, which is the default address. The other is the PC plus four plus 12. Okay, and 12 is the three lines of code away. So I need to decide, or I need to decide which is the next line to execute. Is it PC plus four or is it the branch line? All right, and that decision is actually through the control signal PC source. So PC source is another control signal that will actually make use of the E0 bit over here to make a decision whether to take the branch or not to take the branch. All right, so you can see that, okay, if, if you look at this whole chapter, okay, from the beginning to the end, what we are trying to do is, okay, step by step, we are trying to build up the processor, okay, by adding multiplexers, additional hardware blocks, and so on, so that we are able to support the different instructions we have. Okay, so we started off with a very basic thing, the R type instruction. Then on the R type, we extend to I type. Then we saw some multiplexer. All right. And then now in the decode stage, we want to support the branch instruction as well. So we need to add some additional hardware. Okay, so we are building up the processor step by step for it to support all the instructions that we want to execute. Okay, so that is what we are trying to do here. Okay, so if you look at this design over here, what we have, 
the bottom half right of the design is from the earlier slides which is what we already have and we know is working okay and this already supports the r type i type branch node word everything it supports okay now in order to support the branch instruction okay we also need to be able to calculate the branch address so that is where this new section at the top here has come in all right so this new section at the top basically is to prepare the branch address in the event that they're going to take the branch okay so that is basically the alu stage okay so we looked at the fetch stage the decode stage and now the alu stage okay so in this next stage is basically the memory access okay so the memory access is only used in two main instructions one is the load and the other is the stop so what is a memory memory is just data memory is similar to instruction memory only the instruction memory only read the data you only read the instructions because you already programmed them but in data memory you can read and you can write okay so you need to provide the address which address in the memory are you referring to then you can either do a read then the data comes out here or do a write that means i supply the data so you can see these are all control signals these are all control signals that means these are all signals that will actually help us to decide whether i'm going to do a read or a write okay from the data memory okay so now let's look at the uh, load word instruction this lower instruction and try to analyze uh, what is what is happening here all right so let's go back to the basic so this is your rs this is your immediate and this is your rt okay so your rs is 22 this is your negative 50 and this is 21 okay so what will come here the content okay the content of register 22 the content of register 22 is going to come here to the first operand of the alu and in the second case is going to be a value of a negative 50 so the negative 50 is going to come here and that is going to be selected to go to the alu stage okay and the alu is going to do a add operation okay because you're supposed to add the base address with the offset all right and this will give me a final address which i will use to point to the memory okay so as before what you're doing is we're doing addition okay and this result is going to point to some memory location okay and since this is a load word that means i want to read the data from the memory so the memory read will be activated okay i'm going to do a read from the memory so since i'm going to do a read from the memory the data will come out on the read data lines okay so that is basically what is happening over here okay if i execute a load instruction now how about a store word instruction okay so for a store word instruction okay it is the other way around that means i'm taking a data from my register and i'm going to write that data to the memory okay so the uh, instruct the opcode encoding is still the same this is still rs this is still rt okay so the rs is here 22 this is rt which is 21 so the content of register 22 is here and the value that i want to add with is negative 50 so the negative 50 is here will come out here and you will go to the go to the multiplexer and the second operand of the alu block okay and the alu control again will do an addition operation so what i have here is content of register 22 negative 50 and that is the address that i want to write the data to 
Okay, that's the address I want to write data to. But the data that I want to write to currently, where is it? It is inside here, register 21. It is here. Okay, so how can I take this data and write to my memory? Okay, so previously the right data was not connected. So now I need to connect the right data. And to do that, what I need to do is I connect the RD2 to my right data. Okay, so this allows me to take the data in the RT register and update the data memory. We update the, the data memory. Now, the last part over here, non, how do I uh, select between memory result and register result? Okay, now coming back to here, if I execute this instruction here, the load word instruction, okay? So eventually, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to take the data that is in the memory, all right? And I'm supposed to write it back to register 21. That means this is the result I'm interested in. All right, this is the result I'm interested in. I'm not interested in this addition result. I'm not interested in that. Correct, but I need the addition result because the addition result gives me the address that I'm going to point to. Okay, but the, the final result that I want is actually the data inside the memory, okay, which is this. Okay, but if I look at a normal R type instruction, then what am I interested in? I'm actually interested in the addition result of register 9 content and register 9 con uh, register 10 content. Okay, so I'm going to do the same addition. Okay. But now I want this result. Okay, this instruction here has nothing to do with memory at all. It's all within the registers. Take content of register 9, take content of register 10, okay, add them up and put the result in register 8. So it has absolutely no link with uh, any dependency on memory. Okay, so how do I go about doing this? That means the value that I'm going to write back to register 8 in this case is the addition result, not some memory access. It is the addition result, okay, which is over here. So now I have two outcomes, correct? Two data that needs to be considered to, to write back. One is the actual ALU result. The second is the data coming out of the memory. Okay, so to make this decision, I add one more multiplexer called memory to register. And this multiplexer will now be able to decide who goes back to be written. Okay, so this is basically, again, the concept is the same. We are trying to use multiplexers and hardware blocks and so on to make the necessary adjustments so that the architecture supports all the instructions that we want to execute. Okay, so now that we already decided which data will be sent back, okay, the last stage is to complete the write, okay, to update the register with a new result. Okay, so this same uh, thing where we are right now, now the, this instruction here is the addition of content of register 9, content of register 10, and put the result in register 8. So this is where we are, content of register 9, content of register 10, the multiplexer will select this to go through. Okay, and then you have a result. Okay, but I'm not interested in the data memory, but I'm interested in taking the answer, putting it into register 8. So I'm going to take this. Okay, I'm going to put it here. All right, and this is the one that will be selected to go to the next stage. So how do I write back? You see this red white line over here? It basically goes all the way back to the right data. So the right data means I want to write back this particular data to, to one of the registers. So which register that is specified here? in the bits. So this would have been selected to come here. 
So the right register, which is the register that I want to update as a result of this instruction, will be selected over here. So this will be register eight. And the data is the data that I get after I perform the ALU operation. Okay, and that basically sort of puts everything together. Okay, in the in the complete data part. Okay, so you you can see that. Uh, okay, this is basically the whole thing. Get the whole thing. All right. Um. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I want to run through this again. All right, just to make sure that everybody is clear, all right, for one of the instruction, all right. Then the other instructions, of course, slowly you can go back and, and see uh, it again. Of course, we will come back to this when we do the tutorial three, which is after the recess week, okay. But, okay, before I close this chapter, all right, I just want to run through this again one more time, step by step, so you understand what is happening. Okay, so just give me a minute. Let me copy this out here. Okay, so this is the entire data part. So let's just go through again huh, one, one, one more time, step by step. Okay, for we will do two instructions. Huh? One is the R type, one is the uh, memory access. Okay, so let's first look at the R type instruction. Okay, so if I say add, okay, uh, 10, 9, and 8. Okay, can I my idea of stick the same number sequence so it's easier for you to relate later on? Okay, so eight, nine, and ten. Okay, so from the instruction, we know that this is your RS, this is your RT, and this is your RD. Alright, so the value nine comes here. Okay, the value ten comes here, and the value eight comes here. Okay, so that is the first step. All right. Now, after that, what happens? So you can see that all these wires are, you can think of them as, as hard wired. That means they are physically wired up already. All right. That means if I take the bits 25 to 21 of the instruction, they will automatically come to the read register one bits of the register file. So I will actually be having a value of 9 over here, a value of 10 over here. And a value of 8 over here. Oh, sorry. 10 also comes here and a value of 8 over here. All right, so that is basically what is happening. Now, in the first stage, all right, we know that the register file will provide the data that is currently specified, uh, the number based on the number specified in RR1 and RR2. So the content of register 9. And the content of register 10 will come out here. Okay, so that is what the register file will produce for us. Okay. Now, what will happen is your ALU source. Okay, so if this, this multiplexer over here is to select between the register data or the immediate value. Okay, because the immediate value is here and that will come here as well. So this will some extent and come here. So we need to decide who goes to the ALU, correct? And since we know that this is an RTA instruction, okay, the control bits in this case, which is the ALU source control bit, will select the upper input to go to the next stage. So you will get the content of register 10. All right, and since this is a add instruction, 
Okay, the ALU control will say I need to do an add operation. Okay, it will say I need to do an add operation, and the result that I get over here, okay, will be the result of content of register nine plus the content of register ten. Okay, so that result will come out here, and at the same time, it will also come here. Okay, now. Since we know that, again, it is an R type instruction, so all the control signal will be having the correct value. So this control signal, mem to register, will automatically select the ALU result, because that is the data, that is the result we want, to pass through the multiplexer. Okay, so that will pass through the multiplexer, go one round here, and come back to the right data. So this is the data I want to write back to, and write back to which register. In this case, I must write back to register eight. So the register destination would have already selected register eight. Okay, that means bits fifteen to eleven to pass through here. So register eight will come here, and that is the register that will get the updated result. Okay, from the ALU. Okay, so for now you just assume that all the control signals are correct. Okay, and that, that and that is the reason why the data will flow in this manner and go back. Okay, and update the correct register. Okay, so that is basically the entire data part for this type of a R type instruction. Okay, uh, I mean the, at the first first few time it will take a while to sort of understand the flow. All right, but once you start to look at it step by step and you look at the instructions then you sort of get the hang of it okay uh, so let me just show you again what the same thing but uh, memory access instruction okay so let's try an, a memory access instruction huh? the same data part complete data part but memory access instruction so let's assume the instruction is load word Okay, so let's just keep it like this. All right, so this is your RS, this is your immediate, and this is your RT. All right, so in this instruction, okay, your RS, which will be seven, will come here. Your RT, which is eight, will come here. And this lower 16 bits will have a value of negative, uh, sorry, a uh, negative 10. All right, and the same thing will happen. Huh? So seven will come here, eight will come here. All right, and the eight will also come here. All right, and the negative 10 will come here. Correct, to sign extent. All right, and what will happen next? The content of register seven will come here. The content of register eight will come here. Okay, and the sign extended immediate value will come here. Okay, which is negative 10. Okay, now since this is a I type instruction, so the ALU operation is actually with one register and one immediate, correct? So that means the multiplexer here will select the immediate value to go through. So the negative 10 will go through. Okay, so one side is the content of register seven, the other side is negative 10, and the ALU will control will say, I need to do an add operation. Okay, so the result you get here is the content of register seven plus a negative 10. Okay. And that data is pointing to the address. And at the same time, you can see that it's also connected here. Okay. Now, this is a load word instruction. Load word instruction means I want to read from memory. 
So when I read from memory means then the memory read control signal will be activated. Okay, so the data that comes, so some data will come out of the data memory and come here. Okay, so that means that since this is a load word instruction, that means I want the content from the memory as the final result, not the ADC answer. So the mem to register multiplexer signal will select the top signal to pass through. Okay, so the top signal will pass through. Again, go around here and come back to the right data. And the right data in this case is specified, okay, from the RT bits. That means this RT bits will be selected as the right register bits will be A. Okay, so what, what I'm trying to show is the entire flow, okay, of what is happening, okay, where you execute R type instruction or I type instruction. Okay, uh, again, I mean, you, you will definitely have things you're not sure about and, and so on, okay, but again, just go through again, okay, uh, later on during the break as well, and then if you still have questions later, we will, we will come back to it. All right, but it will take a while, okay, to, to sort of see the whole flow of what is happening. All right, okay, so one thing I want to highlight, all right, is what I've shown you here and here is what I, uh, what, what will happen based on the instruction that we are executing. But what is also happening are all the things that we also don't actually need to happen. Okay, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Now, if I look back at this instruction over here, R type instruction, okay? In this R type instructions, we know that the bit is RS, RT, RD. There is no immediate value here, correct? There is no 16 bit immediate value here. But, okay, but the lower 16 bits are already hardwired to be extracted and passed through a sign extend and come here. Okay, so what does that mean? That means the hardware will behave in a preset manner, okay, because it is already hardwired to do so. Okay, then along the way, we will make decisions and then decide what to do or what to take and so on. All right, uh, so it is not to, that, okay, it's the R type instruction, so the sign extension won't happen. The 16 bits won't be extracted, no it will still happen anyway. It's just that the multiplexer over here will decide who goes to the next stage. Okay, so that is the thing that I want you to understand. That means things will always happen, many things will happen concurrently, all right, because they are hardwired, all right? But the multiplexers uh, along the way will help us to decide what data to take, what data to, to ignore. All right, so the same thing over here, all right. In this example, you are doing a addition between the RS and immediate, okay? So there is only one register data that we read is this. But since the RT bits are connected to the re-register to, that also comes out over here. That means I will still read the contents of register 8 and it will come out on RD2, but I'm not going to use it. Okay, I'm not going to read the data from register 8 in this uh, instruction because the operation is only between the content of register 7 and the immediate value. So I'm interested in the immediate value coming through over here. Okay, so again, the register file will still go ahead to read register it data and provide me the data. Okay, but I will ignore it because the multiplexer will actually select the immediate value to go to the ALU stage. All right, so, so these are the things that you must understand. Okay, so the, in the processor, there are many, many things that will happen concurrently. Okay, because they are already uh, hardwired, okay, or the hardware blocks are already there to perform these actions. Okay, then along the way, okay, we will decide Okay, which part of the uh, outputs of one stage will go on to the next stage and so on. Okay, so that is through the multiplexers and selectors and so on. 
All right, so that is basically the entire complete data part. Okay, the complete data part. All right, uh, so it, it looks, okay, it may look a bit uh, scary, okay, but you will get used to it, okay, after a while. All right, so similarly, okay, similarly, you can also see that this sign extended immediate value also comes here and is a shift left by two and, and add with PC plus four. Okay, so even though this is not a branch instruction, okay, I will still go ahead and do this and I will get some value here. I'll get some value here. But if it is not a branch instruction, then I will just take the top one, which is PC plus four as the next address to, uh, to fetch the instruction from. Okay, because the control signal PC source will decide that for me. Okay, so this left shift by two, this addition, everything is hardwired. So even though it is not a branch instruction, it is a load word, or even if it's a read instruction, I will still go ahead and still do this. I will still do this. Okay, it's just that the multiplexer here will decide whether I need to use that or I just stick with the PC plus four. All right, so that is basically the entire okay, complete data part. Okay, uh, so don't worry, we will be going through this again in more detail when we do the uh, tutorial three, okay, which is after the break. Okay, now I just want to carry on to the next chapter, which is chapter eight, okay, because that is actually very, very closely related to this. Okay, and once you do that, we sort of close the whole loop already. Okay, so let's, let's go on to the next set of slides, which is control, okay, lecture eight, control. Okay, so in this set of slides, okay, the control block okay, is basically to again reinforce the idea of how we manage to make data flow in a particular way. Right? Because so many things are happening, right? so many things are happening concurrently. How do we ensure that data is actually being channeled in the correct pathway as it goes along? Okay, so this is the, the data part that we already have built up. Okay. And these are all the control signals. Okay, the register destination, register write, ALU source, ALU control, mem write, mem read, PC source, and mem to register. Okay, so these are all the various control signals. So let's look at each of these signals step by step, okay, to see how they are linked. Okay, so the first one is the register destination. So the register destination here is to decide whether the RT bits location, 20 to 16, or RD bits location are selected for the right register. Okay, so that is actually uh, through the type of instruction, whether it is R type instruction or I type instruction. Okay, so the R type instruction will select uh, yeah. kind of here. So the R type instruction will select register destination as one. So when it's one means it's this. So the zero is on top. Okay, one is below. So when the register destination is a one, that means I will select the bottom one to go through. Okay, and this is for R type. Okay, if it's I type, then you would have been zero and the RT bit would be the right register. Okay, so the multiplexer will, uh, all the multiplexers will have the control signals which will decide which one goes through, okay, like what we saw. And all these control signals come from another block called the control block. Okay, so we don't need to uh, look into how the control block is designed, all right? And we're not going to cover that, but we just need to know that there is another block called the control block, which will actually generate all these various signals for me, okay, to make sure that it is correct for whatever instruction I'm executing. Okay, now when I look at this R type and I type, 
you will notice that for all the R type instruction, you have an output which is zero, and you have a function field. So the function field can be used to differentiate the various instructions that I have. For all the other instructions, you only rely on the output, okay, to decide what is the instruction I'm going to execute. So the opcode is a six bits unique code, all right, that you can actually use to identify the, the particular instruction that you're executing. So let's look at each of the multiplexers. So for register destination, zero is on top, one is below, okay? So when it's R type instruction, okay, it will actually be uh, one, when it's I type, it will be zero. Okay, so this is the R type instruction. And this is the I type. Okay, so why R type? Because for R type, this is your RS, RT, RD. So that RD is the destination register. So that is the register that is supposed to be channeled to the uh, right register. Whereas for I type, the RT is the register that you're supposed to write back to. Okay, so the register destination is basically zero or one, depending on whether it is I type or R type. Okay, how about register write? So register write is to tell the register file that I want to write back to a register. Okay, so in order for me to write back to a register is only true if I supposed to have a value updated. And when do I have to update a value? So there are two possible scenarios, correct? One is R type. Because for R type instructions, Okay, whatever is the instruction, you already have three registers. Okay, you have your RS, RT, and your RD. So there's always a register that I need to write back to. The other one is your I type, and that particular I type is, okay, uh, also again, instructions where you say that at I, RT, RS, and then immediate value. So that also will require you to update to a register. So that also means the register right must be one. Okay, or the other type is your load word instruction. Because a load word instruction, you are taking the contents from the memory and updating it to a register. Okay, so basically this depends, okay, this register right signal basically depends on the instruction you're executing. Is your instruction uh, the final outcome is supposed to update a register. If it's supposed to update a register, then you say register right is one. If it is not supposed to update any register, for example, branch, okay, or store word, then you don't need to uh, set register right. Okay, the next one is ALU source. So the ALU source, as you can see, is two, selecting between two inputs. One is the read register two or the 16 bit sign extender value. Okay, so again, this is when it is R type generally, and this is for the I type. Okay, so when it's R type, okay, you will definitely take from the read register two. When it's I type, you are having an immediate value, so you take the 16 bit extender value. So the ALU source again will select whether it is read register data to or the uh, sign extension. Okay, so almost all multiplexers, if you look at the values here, it is zero on top, one below. Okay, except for one multiplexer, which is this one. Okay, we will look, look at that in a while. Okay, next is the memory and memory signal. So this memory and memory signals are very straightforward, is whether you need to deal with the data memory. So if, for example, if I need to do a memory read, when do I need to do a memory read? When I read from my address, and that is load word instruction. Okay, when I'm doing a load word means, I want to take the content of the memory and update a register. So there is a memory read involved. Okay, so I need to set memory read. Memory write is the opposite. That means I want to update the memory with some new data. So that is basically your store word instruction. 
So in a storeboard instruction, you are taking the data from a register and updating it to a new uh, memory location. So if you're doing that, you're doing a storeboard uh, instruction, then you set memory, right? Okay, the last one here is the mem to register. So this is the only register where the one is on top, zero is below. Okay, so when mem to register is one, that means it is going from memory to the register. Okay, why? This is the memory and going back to where? Going back to the register. So that's why the one is on top. Okay, so if it is zero, then is the ALU result. Okay, so the easiest way to look at it is this is for I type instructions, which is basically your load word. ALU result could be R type and could be I type. Okay, depending on the type of instruction. So it could be the R type, which is all three registers, or it could be I type, which is immediate, that means at immediate is something, something. All right, so it could be R type and I type. But the uh, memory to register being one, this is always the load word instruction because you are taking the data that you have read from the memory and you're updating a register. Okay, so that is your mem to register signal. Okay, the final one over here is the PC source. So as I mentioned, the PC source here is to decide between two possible addresses. One is your PC plus four, and the other is your PC plus four plus the branch, branch address, a branch offset. Okay, so this is again dependent on the is zero bit. So this is the branch if equal. Okay, so if the branch is supposed to be taken, then I use that particular line to make a decision. All right, and how I do that is actually I use a AND gate here. So what is an AND gate? AND gate basically means that if both the inputs are true, then the output is true. Okay, any input is false, the output is false. So one of the input is a branch. That means the control unit over here must tell me that this is a branch instruction. Okay, the next true here is whether it is zero. This is zero means what? So if is zero equal to true, what does that mean? That means there, you can say that they are equal. I mean, the two registers you are trying to check for, they are actually equal. All right, so if it is equal, then I will actually go to the new branch address, which is PC plus four. And this is the uh, sign extension shift left by two. Okay. And if I do not, need to take the branch, then it will be PC plus 4 only. Okay, so this is basically the offset, the line, the line offset that I need to add with. All right, so this branch will only be taken if it is a branch instruction and the condition is true. The condition is true based on the ALU checking the is zero bit. Okay, so when E0 is true, it implies that the values are equal. That means, for example, if the instruction is VEQ 3, 4, and 7. Okay, so if, if register 3 content is equal to register 4 content, then the E0 will be equal to true. Okay, so if the two content, I mean the register content of both of them here is the same, then the E0 bit will be set. E0 bit is set means this come true. And the branch, if it's a branch instruction, this will be true, though I will take the branch. So in this case, I'll branch to seven lines away. Okay, seven lines away. 
All right, so that is basically the entire control unit. Okay, the entire control unit. Okay, the, the only thing that we are not going to go into the detail is the ALU control. Okay, so the ALU control is basically these four bits. Okay, so these four bits are the ones that are supposed to uh, tell the ALU exactly what operation to carry out. Is it an add operation? Is it a shift operation? An end or anything like that? Okay, so that decoding is a lot more uh, sort of more complex. Okay, because you need to look at a lot of other logical relationships between the opcode and the function speed and so on. Okay, so that part we are not going to cover. But again, we can take it that the control unit will be able to correctly send the various signals to the, the multiplexers and the ALU control and everything to make sure that the data flows through each stage correctly. Okay, so that basically sort of uh, puts everything together over here. Okay, so you can see this is the complete data part and ALU control. Okay, so the ALU control part alone, we, we are not going to go into the detail, but the, I think the important part is all the other multiplexers and, uh, and, and the registers that we see over here. And for us to understand that uh, everything is sort of, a, a lot of things are happening in parallel. And this control block is actually very important because it helps us to make the correct decision on um, what, what passes through. So for example, is it this register pass through? Is it this register pass through? Is it this register? pass through and so on. Okay, so we need to make uh, decisions on, along all the way, all right? And the control unit actually helps us to achieve the correct uh, flow of data. All right, so that is basically the entire uh, pathway. All right, uh, so what I want to do is I, want, I will, we will go for a break now, all right? So, uh, there's only a few slides left, but I want to go for a break now to cut before I cover this last slide. Okay, so this last few slides is to sort of recap the entire flow and relate it back to each type of instruction. Okay, so that we understand what is happening and why we put these values here. All right, and I think it's also a good time for you to just do a quick recap and, and, and clarify whatever doubts and things that you want to ask. Okay, so let's go for now. It's nine. Now it's seven forty. Okay, so we can go for fifteen minutes break. Seven fifty-five. We come back. Okay, and then I will go through these uh, remaining slides. Okay, and to cover this entire MIPS architecture and the control design part. Okay, and after that, then we will talk about the tutorial. Okay, so I'll see you all back here in uh, fifteen minutes time. Okay, any questions you have, you can just put it in the chat first. Okay, later when we come back, I will address those questions. Okay. Okay, so welcome back. All right, so let's um, continue from this uh, chapter eight on control. Okay, so now we are, what we are going to do is we're just going to look through, all right, on all these various registers, okay, and uh, try to make sense of what should be the values, all right, and, and why some of them is one, some is zero, some is X, okay? So let's look at the first type, R type instructions. So for R type instructions, okay, we know that the destination uh, register destination is always going to be the RD. Okay, which means that this 15 to 11 is the one that is supposed to be selected. Okay, so this is 0, this is 1. So the register destination is going to be 1. Okay, how about ALU source? ALU source in this case is you're going to select the second operand. Correct? The sec so in the, the second operand is always going to be the register value. So that is the one that is supposed to go through here. Okay, so it is zero. Okay, so if you remember all the multiplexes, zero is on top, one is below, except for the mem to register is the other way around. So in the mem to register, 
Okay, what we want for R type instruction. Okay, so for example, if I say add 10, 9, and 8. Okay, so we want to add two registers. Okay, and you want the result of the addition. That means the ALU result. So the ALU result is actually here. Okay, so that zero is the one that should go through. So it's zero. Okay, we are going to update a register at the end of the instruction. So the register right is one. Okay, we are not doing any form of memory access here. Okay, there's no form of memory access. There's no memory read and there's no memory write. So both are zero and we're not doing a branch. Okay, so the ALU op, you can ignore. Okay, we're not going to cover the ALU op. So we can ignore the ALU op bits. Okay, so let's look at a load word instruction. So for load word instruction, okay, so I was register five. Okay, the register destination, so this will be RS and this will be RT. So there is no RD over here. So the register destination is actually RT, which is means this bits. Okay, so this is the one that is supposed to go through here. So the register destination is zero. Okay, the ALU source is supposed to be the immediate value here, 16 bit sign extended immediate value. So this is the one. So it is a one. Right. So for a low word instruction, we are actually taking from memory. Okay, we're taking this data and you want this data to go through. So the mem to register is one. And we are doing a register right at the end of it because we are updating one of the registers. And there is a memory read, but we're not doing a memory write. Okay, and it's not a branch. Okay, let's look at the next one, store word instruction. So for store word, for example, store word, the same thing, let's say five and register two. Okay, so for a store word instruction, the register destination here is X. Now, why is it X? Okay, because the register run is zero. Okay, for a store word instruction, we are taking the data from a register and updating to a memory. We are not, uh, at the end of the instruction, we are not updating any register value. So since register write is zero, we are not updating register value. What Whatever register destination is, whether it's zero or one really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So it's, that's why I put it as an X. Okay. The ALU source in this case is again the immediate value. Okay. So in this case, it is the sign extended immediate value. So it's a one. Okay. Mem to register. Okay. Mem to register is again irrelevant. This multiplexer is not relevant because this multiplexer is only important when we need to send something back to write to the register. But since register write is already zero, mem to register doesn't matter. Okay, so whatever data goes back to the to the write register bits doesn't matter. Okay, so in this we are not doing a memory read, but we are doing a memory write. Okay, the last part is the BEQ instruction. So, for example, BEQ, register 3, register 5, and 7. So, in the BEQ instruction, again, the same thing. The register right is 0. So, there is X for register destination. It doesn't matter. Okay, we are comparing two register values. So, RD1 and RD2 both are needed. So, the ALU source is 0. So, this is the one I need. Okay, so ALU source is zero. Okay, there is no memory to register. Uh, there is no update of register. So memory register is X. And we're not doing any memory read or memory write. And the branch in this case is a one. Okay, so this is the only instruction where the branch is a one. So this bit over here is a one. Okay, so depending on whether the condition for the check is true or false, then the branch will be taken. All right. So this 
again summary sort of looks at all the register bits okay and uh, tries to make sense of why we perform uh, or use this control uh, selectors all right to to sort of manage the flow of data through the processor okay so of course uh, what are the current shortcomings of the design that we have okay so if you look at this there are many many stages right there are many many stages for the uh, data to pass through and each of this actually consumes some time okay so memory alu register file access each of them consume some time all right so as a result the time that it takes to complete an instruction in this case the worst case scenario is the load word instruction okay so the lower instruction uh, why it's the longest because you need to access uh, every element okay the instruction memory the data memory uh, read register alu and finally write write the register again okay so it, you is basically the worst case uh, scenario okay and since this is the worst case scenario you need to make sure that you cannot clock it faster than the slowest instruction okay so it, it just like you know uh, you, you need to always make sure that the, the, the you cannot go as fast as the slowest person in the group correct then the, the slowest person in the group will left behind okay so the same thing so the the longest instruction which is a load word okay uh, that means the clock frequency of your processor has to be slow enough to allow that particular instruction to complete okay uh, of course uh, there are many many improvements to the processor architecture to make it more efficient so from so so from the single cycle implementation that we are looking at the one of the solution is multi cycle implementation where every instruction is is in one clock cycle the other is the pipeline okay so the pipeline uh, instruction uh, i mean the pipeline design i will share with you the slides and, and the e lecture but this is not examinable uh, this is just for your information only okay if you're interested to know about how the current architecture can be improved okay uh, using this pipeline approach then there's something you can look at okay so basically with this we sort of cover all the entire mips architecture design so we have talked about everything from the uh, assembly language code okay to instruction encoding the architecture design and the control block and everything okay so you have an entire uh, sort of overview of everything that is going on at the very low level of the processor all right so that is basically the objective of the first half okay of the um, uh, module all right so what we will do now is we will go on to uh, discuss the tutorial two questions okay so i know i only uploaded them today uh, sorry about that okay but i think we can still discuss anyway all right uh, and understand what is happening okay so in tutorial two okay the question one i will not go through question one is just to uh, take a data and, and print out it print out in bit bit uh, bit by bit uh, and look at the various operations Okay, the code is already given there. Okay, so you can use any uh, uh, debugging uh, or software development tool to write, type in the code and run it and see how it works. Okay, so I will, I will go to question one. I think you can try that. So I'll go straight to question two. So in question two, we are asked to look into swapping. All right. So the way we do swapping, I think you, you are very familiar with this, is the traditional approach is okay if i want to swap two variables a and b okay what i need to do is i can create a third variable okay t okay so in the first step a go to t okay and the other variable b okay so whatever is in a go into uh, b so sorry, B go into A. Okay, and finally T go into B. 
Okay, so basically you swap it around. So A eventually comes to B and B eventually goes to A. All right, so that is the traditional way of doing swapping, okay, using a third variable over here. Okay, the other alternative is actually doing this exclusive all operation. Okay, so I'm not sure you've done this before. Okay, where you can actually do uh, exclusive all with the two variables to actually extract out and do a swapping, okay, between them. Okay, so this actually works, all right, and I want to show you how it works, okay, step by step, so you actually see it, um, and don't, don't just take it uh, for what I say. Okay, so let's assume that A has a particular value over here, so I'm going to give it a value 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay, I'm going to give another video uh, B. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, so, so, yeah. So, A has this value. Okay. Uh, and B has, I guess I'm going to put in some values here. 0, 1, 1, 0. 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay. So, let's go through this uh, step by step. Okay. So, in the first line over here, Okay, which is asterisk A equals to asterisk A exclusive or with asterisk B. Okay, so I'm going to do exclusive or. So this, this hat over there is exclusive or. Uh, first of all, exclusive or gate. Okay, uh, basically, if you look at the truth table, so if A, B, and X, okay. As long as the two inputs are different, the output is a one. When two inputs are the same, the output is a zero. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and do this. So this one, the answer you get is, okay, this last two bits are different, so it's one. Same is zero, different is one. Same is zero. Uh, Zero, zero, one, one. Okay, so that is basically the. So I'm, I'm going to call this the A from step one. Okay, so you do the step one. Now let's do the step two. So the step two says is asterisk B is equals to asterisk A exclusive or. Okay, so asterisk A exclusive or with asterisk uh, B. Okay, so let me do that over here. Okay, so B. So this is actually the updated A, correct? So this uh, A is actually the new updated A. That means the A from step one. 
I'm going to do exclusive all with the B. So this and this together, exclusive all. So one and one will be zero, 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 zero will be zero. Zero and one is one, one and zero is one. Zero, 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 one, zero is one. One, one is zero, zero, one is one. Okay, and this is now the B. So I'm going to call this B from step two. Okay, and what do you see now? This B from step two is actually the A. That means the value in A is already now transferred over to B. Okay, so now let's complete it with the last step. Okay, so I'm going to go to the last step here. So the last step is asterisk A is equals to asterisk A exclusive all with asterisk B. Okay, and this B is the new updated B. That right, means the, the new B over here. All right, and the A is also the updated A from step one. So it's basically an exclusive all between these two. So one zero is one zero zero is zero, one one is zero, one is one, this is zero, this is one, this is one, this is zero. Okay, what do you see? This is actually the old B coming to the as the new A. So this is A from step three. Okay, so you can see that the old A is now the new B, and the old B is now the new A. All right, so this is again uh, another technique of doing a swap without actually having to create an additional variable. Okay, so again, this is just to sort of again uh, sort of look at the idea that uh, there are always different techniques available, correct, which may be more efficient. Okay, uh, in terms of the, the memory or speed and so on. Okay, so there's a question of how marks are given for such question. Okay, so again, it depends on, uh, you know, whether we give you some values, ask you to show the sequence or, you know, uh, or it's an MCQ question with just a final answer and things like that. All right, so I, I think as long as you answer the question uh, based on what is required, then I think, Whatever is the marks you should be able to get, whether it's MCQ or structure or anything like that. Okay, so this question is just to give you the idea of uh, uh, how this works. Okay, so these numbers are just some values only. They are not any. It, it, it could be address. It could be data. Okay, it is just a, a, a random value that I just give it just to show you how this second uh, algorithm works. Okay, so it's not uh, relating to anything in particular. It's just some random values, okay, that I put here to show you how the exclusive all works. Okay, so let me go on to the next question here, question three. Okay, so in this question three, we are given a mapping, all right, that A maps to uh, S0 and B maps to S1, all right, and what is the outcome when I perform these operations? All right, so for the first one, A, uh, B is equals to A percentage. 16. Now, when you say percentage means actually what are you trying to find? Is the remainder. Okay, is the remainder after you divide by a number. Okay, so to maybe get a better recap of this, let, let's go back to our basic number system, uh, base 10. So if I say C is equals to D percentage 10. All right, that means I divide by 10 and I want the remainder. Okay, so for example, if D has a value of 92, so whatever is the tens is what I will get. 
uh, from the as a multiple of 10 and this is the remainder so it's equivalent to 90 remainder 2 yes, that means I divide by 10 and I take the remainder so I will get the answer of 2 all right so if I want to take the same thing 99 again it will be the same thing okay it will be 90 remainder 9 okay so the remainder value that you get over here is always in the range of 0 to, in this case, 1 minus 10, 10 minus 1, which is 9. Okay, so you're looking for a remainder that is up to this number. It is up to this number. So the remainder value is always going to be 0 to 9. Okay, so that is how the, the, the percentage sort of operator works. Okay, or the modulo operator. Now, this same uh, thinking is basically what we need to apply to this. That means if I say percentage 10, that means the answer I'm looking for is 0 to 9. When I say percentage 16, the answer I'm looking for is 0 to 15. Okay, that means the final answer when I do a modulo 16 is going to be a value which is from 0 to 15. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, when I say 0 to 15 means what? Okay, if I take 0 all the way to 15, in terms of binary, what does that mean? That means it is 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so 0 to 15 is actually occupying the full 4 bits or the lower 4 bits of the number. Okay, that means to get this answer, all you need to do is to take the A value. Okay, whatever is the value. Okay, uh, and I multi and make sure that I just extract out the lower four bits alone, and everything else I can discard because the lower four bits is the one that map to the. 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1111. Okay, so the way to sort of code this in assembly would be to say that is n i. Okay, so let's say assume the, the answer is S1, right? So S1, S0 with 0xf. Okay, so what, what am I doing here? I'm taking the S0 value and I'm going to do a N with 0xf. So when I do an N with 0xf, what happens? Only the last four bits are 1, 1, 1, 1. The rest are all zeros. Okay, so the result of this would be what? The result of this would be that only the last four bits from here I'm here and everything else will be zero okay and that is actually the answer when i do this operation because the answer that i expect is the answer from zero to 15 that means you only occupy the last four bits of your data okay now why why why, why is this example why, why why do we have to go to this example to see how what it works Okay, because I think the, the message that we're trying to get across is that mathematically, when we look at it, when I say A percentage 16, we can say that it is basically I need to do a division, and for the division, I take the remainder. Okay, so mathematically, we know this is the operation, okay, to get the answer. Okay, but a division or a multiplication is considered a very expensive operation. Okay, why? Because it takes up a lot of clock cycles. Okay, it's very resource intensive for the processor. Okay, so as much as possible, okay, the compiler will look at alternative ways of uh, implementing the same code, the same logic in using more efficient uh, approaches. Okay, so that's where the compiler may make such a decision, all right, to say that, okay, since this is what you want, all right? We can actually rearrange this as a end instruction. 
and, and get the same answer. Okay, instead of me trying to do a division and then looking at the remainder. Okay, so that is basically the idea behind this. That means the compiler, again, we can't really say, correct, uh, how the compiler might behave. Okay, but in most cases, compilers are very, very smart now. Right? So they are able to uh, look at more efficient ways of representing your high level code into something that is more efficiently uh, uh, represented to map to the hardware. Okay, so that is basically the, the, the first question there. For the second question, okay, B equals A divided by 8 multiplied by 8. Okay, so how, how does that work? A divided by 8 multiplied by 8. Okay, so now to do this, um, what uh, the compiler might do. Okay, again, whenever you, it has a division or a multiplication, okay, generally what it will try to do is it will try to see if it can replace division and multiplication by shift operations. Okay, why? Because shift operations are much, much more efficient compared to a division operations. Okay, so uh, as we saw, okay, whenever I shift left by one is two to the power of the, the number of bits. Okay, so eight is actually two to the power of three. Okay, so division by eight is equivalent to shift left by three. And uh, sorry, uh, shift right by three. And multiplication by eight is equivalent to shift left by three. All right, so these are the two uh, more efficient implementations of uh, doing a divide and multiply. So what is the outcome of this? What is the outcome of this? Okay, so to understand this, let's look at a. Okay, let's give it some values. Okay, so let's assume the value is something like this. Okay. The very first step is divide by eight, which means I shift right by three. So when I shift right by three, what happens? Everything goes to the right by three bits. Okay, so the one over here comes here. Alright, so you have one, zero, okay, and then you will have uh, zero, zero, one, one. Okay, and then you have three zeros in front, okay, because you shift to the right by three. Okay, so this is your A, shift right by three. So when you shift right by three, what happens? The lower three bits get discarded. Okay, now in the next instance, I shift left by three. So when I shift left by three, what happens? This comes back here. So it's one, zero. Okay, all the way here. So we come one, one, zero, zero. And what gets shifted in? Zero, zero, zero. Okay, so the last three bits now become zero, zero, zero. Because when you shift in, you're shifting in zeros. Okay, so technically these two lines of code, what are they doing? They are actually sharing the last three bits of the uh, of the of the data in in the a variable okay so this is equivalent to if you were to write it in instruction assembly language instruction you can say is shift right logical okay s0 by three bits and we put it into some other register and then shift left logical T0 by three bits and put it into S1 register. Okay, so this is basically um, what these two lines of code might do. Okay, or might translate to. Okay, at the assembly language. Okay, because uh, again, the compiler will always look at what it can do to avoid 
multiplication and division operations. Okay, so even though in your code you may have all these multiplication and division, the compiler will try its best to uh, see how we can avoid these instructions. Okay, and, and solve it some other way. Okay. So let me go on to the last question here. Okay, so in this last question here, basically we are looking at three, uh, we're looking at this code over here, and we want to know what is the value of register S1 at the end of the third uh, iteration of this loop. Okay, so let's look at it step by step. Okay, uh, so S1. Okay, so we have register S1 with a value of zero. Okay, and we have register uh, T0 with a value of uh, 112. Okay, and then we have, we're also using register T1. So T1 over here. Okay, so let's look at the first line. The first line says branch is equal T0 with zero. So if T0 is equal to zero, then of course you will exit. Okay, well in our case, T0 is a non-zero value, so you will not take the branch. Then we go to the next line. What do we do? We take T0 plus zero. So T0 has a value of 112. Okay, add with zero. So it still becomes 112. And that is actually pointing to a memory address. So if you remember the load word, whatever that we put in the second half of the instruction, that is actually a pointer to the memory. So which memory? 112. Okay, we're going to point to this memory 112 and we're going to take the data in that memory location 108 and put it into T1. So T1 now has a value of uh, 108. Okay, in the next line, what am I doing? I'm doing an add between S1, T1, and put it back into S1. So S1 is initially zero. So zero plus 108, I'll get a value of 108. Okay, so S1 is no longer zero, but S1 is 108. Okay, the next line, load word with uh, 4 plus T0. So T0 is still the same, it's still pointing to 112, but 112 now plus 4. So I point to the next, uh, after next 4 bytes. And I'm going to take that data, in this case is 124, and I'm going to put it into T0 register. So now from 112, it has become 124. Okay, and then I jump back to the loop. Okay, so that is basically the first iteration of the loop. Okay, the first iteration of the loop. Okay, so before I continue, I just want to pause here for a while and see whether anybody has any questions, anything you want to ask first. Any questions, anything that anybody wants to ask? Okay, so if no questions, let's go to the second iteration of the loop. So in the second iteration of the loop, again, we are going to do the same set of instructions. So the first step is, uh, is T0 0, T0 is not 0, so I will not branch. Load word T0 0 point, uh, with ourselves zero. So T0 is pointing to 124 now. So 124 plus zero is 124, and I take that data, which is 104, and I put it into my T1 register. So my T1 register uh, now has a value of 104. Then I add S1 with T1 put back into S1. So S1 is currently 108. 
plus T1, which is 104, I'll get 212. Okay, then I do a load word of T0 plus 4. So T0 is currently pointing to 124. So 124 plus 4 is 128. And I take the data, which is 100, and put it into T0. Okay, and then I go back to the loop. So this is the value 100 and go back to the loop. Okay, so this is the second iteration of the loop. All right, so let's do it one more time, the third iteration of the loop. So in the third iteration of the loop, what happens? Again, T0 is not zero, so I will not exit. So I load T0, so T0 is now pointing to 100. And I'll take the content of T0 plus zero, which is 100, which is 120 and put it into T1. Then I do the add again. So it's 212 plus 120, which will be 332. Okay, and then I do a load word of T0 plus 4. Okay, which is 132. Okay, 132 going into T, T0. And I go back to loop. So I now completed three iterations already. Okay, so the value of register S1 at the end of three iteration is 332. Three, three, okay, 332. Three, three, okay, so in part B, we are asking if I want to terminate the loop at the fourth check. So this is now the fourth check. I already completed three rounds, and now I'm in the fourth check. And I want to terminate the loop. So if I want to terminate the loop, this condition must be satisfied. So this condition says that T0 is equal to 0, then I exit. So T0, okay, the last update of T0 was from this address location, which was from uh, address location uh, 100, correct? 100 plus 4. Okay, so we took from this location here 100 plus 4. Okay, so the 132 came from there. Okay, so if the 132 came from there, okay, if I wanted to now exit, if I want to exit, T0 should have had a value of 0. Okay, so the content of here should have been replaced with a 0. So instead of 132, if the content of address location 104 was zero, then when I go back and do that fourth uh, check of the VEQ, I would be able to fulfill that condition and I will be able to exit the loop. All right, so that is basically how you go about looking at this. So this question is, so I'm making us revise those basic programming concepts, the loops, the branch, the load word, and so on. Okay, and how to use the offset, okay, the load word to access the different memory locations. Okay, so only three, uh, four questions. The first question I think you can do on your own. Okay, so that basically wraps up tutorial two. Does anybody have any uh, questions regarding this? Anything you want to ask? Okay, so don't worry, all this I will upload, okay, uh, together with the official results in, in this document as well. So you can reference this uh, when you're doing the revision. Okay, so if no questions, okay, uh, what I would like to do now is to just go through the, uh, give me a minute though. Okay, so basically next week is your recess week. Okay, so there are no classes next week. Okay, uh, so you can have a good break. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to talk about the assignment and the term paper. Uh, so let me open up the luminous as well so you can see it. Uh, give me a minute. Huh? Okay, so uh, over here, 
under your files, if you go to files, okay, there is uh, under labs and there is assignment one. So under labs, all right, there is a lab one document over here. Okay, so this lab one document, okay, you don't need to submit, okay, is for you to get familiarized, okay, with how to use this software tool called QT Spin. Okay, QT Spin is basically a software sort of emulator for the um, MIPS architecture. All right, so it's very easy to use, very straightforward. Uh, so inside over here, the download files are here, okay, plus some uh, help documents. All right, and this uh, lab one is just for you to practice only, okay, you don't need to submit or, or anything like that. So this lab one is for you to practice, okay, uh, getting familiarized with the um, files. I mean, the, the way the QD Spim works and how to write your assembly language files and compile it, things like that. All right. Now, once you get familiarized with all of that, then you can go ahead to do the assignment one. Okay, so the assignment one is also uploaded here. Okay, so let me uh, download and show it to you. Okay, so in a lab assignment one, basically, uh, you're given some simple assembly language code and you're supposed to make some modification from it. Okay, so it's, it's fairly uh, doable, all right? Uh, again, you just need to go through that early document to get familiarized, okay, with the programming techniques and then you just fill in all these blanks and, and, and uh, read the answer, all right? And then you fill up the document here to explain what is happening and what, what is the data, the registers, and so on. Okay, so again, QD Spim is, is, is a very easy, straightforward uh, software tool. Just go through the lab one to get familiarized with how it works first. Again, okay, once you're familiarized with that, then you should be able to uh, go ahead and uh, do this. Okay, uh, so this is really very, very easy. Okay, I think. Uh, almost all uh, students get uh, full marks for this. Okay, so it's, it's really a very easy assignment to, to help you get some marks. Okay, uh, so just make sure you do it. Okay, so the due date I put is 8 March, which is basically uh, three weeks from now. Okay, uh, I would say three, three weeks is definitely more than enough. Okay, this. Okay. Uh, it would not take more than maybe uh, two hours or so, okay, uh, to do it. Okay, uh, even going to the lab document and doing this. All right, so uh, so you have three weeks. Okay, so the submission uh, is inside this uh, folder here, assignment one submission folder. Okay, so make sure that you uh, submit it by uh, by the due date. Okay, the assignment one submission. All right, so that is the assignment, all right, for that. Okay, uh, then you also have one uh, term paper. Okay, so this term paper is to... Where's the term paper? Okay, so I think I haven't uploaded a term paper document. Let me bring it out here with them. Okay, so this is a term paper, all right. Uh, uh, again, this term paper is, again, is, is in replacement of a uh, uh, midterm or anything. Okay, so it is uh, basically to take the current MIPS architecture that we have, 
and sort of do some slight redesign of it. Okay, some slight redesign based on this um, requirements over here. Okay, so what are we supposed to do? So in the MIPS architecture, all right, basically from what we have seen, okay, we have covered how it works, okay, how instructions are formed, how we decode it, and so on. Okay. And the thing that we know about the MIPS architecture is everything is 32 bits. All right, so if you look at the MIPS architecture, all the instructions are 32 bits. Okay, so it's full 32 bit. Okay, and then from there you have the output, okay, which is six bits, and then the rest depend on the type of instructions we are dealing with. Okay, uh, so we have five bits for the registers. Okay, so when you have five bits for the registers, okay, RS, RT, RD, and so on. So two to the power of five, you get 32 registers. Okay, and so on. Okay, so the, the bits that we use, how many bits we use, plays a part in how many registers we have, that how many instructions we support and so on. Okay, so in this term paper, what you're supposed to do is, you're supposed to design a processor, but this time only using 18-bit instructions. Okay, using only 18-bit instructions. That means the same idea, okay, the same idea, except that instead of 32-bit, you are now going towards 18-bit. Okay, so when you go towards 18 bit, okay, you need to make some decisions. Okay, so for example, if I say that I'm going to set aside six bits for output, same as before, then what is left? I only have 12 bits left. Okay, with the 12 bits, how am I going to break it up? Okay, so I'm not saying that you need to use six bits, huh? so it's up to you to decide how you want to do it. Okay, so if I say I want to use four bits over here, Okay, there I got 14 bits left. Okay, so it's all up to you to decide how many bits you use for the various parts of the instruction, opcode, registers, and so on. Okay, and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to come up with some design that covers all of this. That means what are the instructions, the type of instructions you will support, the operations you will support, arithmetic and logical operations, how many registers will you have, and so on. Okay, so for example, okay, if I say that I set aside uh, three bits for the register, three, three, and three. Okay, so if I have three bits, that means I have a total of eight registers. Okay, so I have registers from register zero all the way to register seven. So I have to do everything within the eight registers. All right, so it's up to you. If you want four bits, then you have 16 registers and so on. So you can decide how many bits you have for the register. Okay, and what you need to do is, based on your design, you come up with a data part and control flow. Okay, so this one, you don't actually need to do anything new. You can actually take the, the entire thing that you have over here. You just take this entire thing, but now you need to change it according to the number of bits. So now all of this won't be five bits. Okay. This five bits, they're going to the read register will not be five bits, right? Because it depends on how many bits you have set aside. Okay, same thing over here. Opcode may not be six bits, will be some other bits, maybe. Okay, so you need to make the necessary adjustments to this architecture to map to whatever that you are designing. Okay, to map whatever you are designing. Okay, so that is the processor design. And after you design the processor, basically you need to come up with a code to execute. So a sequence of uh, assembly language instructions. So these assembly language instructions, again, they are now your own instructions. Okay, you don't need to follow the MIPS assembly language because it's not the same anymore. It's 32 bit for MIPS, but now it's 18 bits. So you come up with your own machine language instructions, assembly language instructions to perform this particular sequence. That means given that uh, you have a number n in a register, you are able to compute the n square and give it give the result. Okay, so in this case, n, yeah, so sorry, n is uh, in a memory location, any particular location. And after you complete, you must write back to the same memory location. Okay, so, so the whole idea is, 
okay when when you do this uh, when you do this uh, term paper so n is just somewhere in the memory and what your code must do is must take it in read this value in okay and you must compute n square and once you compute n square take this and write it back in the same memory location Again, okay, this is just to uh, this will follow your own processor design. Okay, not the MIPS processor design or assembly language code. Okay, because to make your life uh, easier, so that you do not spend so much of time and effort and you know, write a two hundred page report. Okay, uh, I have made it very simple. It's only maximum of five pages. Okay, so it's single sided, soft copy five pages only maximum okay uh, font size 10 minimum line spacing 1.15 all right and only five pages will be marked so if you put even if you have 10 page report you'll only mark the first five pages all right so it is not something that you need to spend a lot of time on uh, you, you need to spend a bit of time to think about all of this first all right to make sure that you know how many bits you want to set aside for these various uh, uh, opcode registers and so on. All right. Uh, if right now it still seems a bit uh, fuzzy and you're still not sure what I'm talking about, then don't worry. You, need, you just need to go back and look through the last, maybe last two lectures, the data part and the control. Okay. Understand what the whole flow is. And right now in this, you're just replicating the whole flow. Okay. Replicating the entire whole flow. Only difference is from 32 bit instruction, it becomes 18 bit instruction. That's all. That's the only difference. Okay. And of course, when your instruction width changes, then all your instructions will also change. Okay. To match the number of bits that you have. Okay. So the submission deadline is week 12. Okay. So it's almost towards the end of the semester. Okay. So you have plenty of time. All right. But again, the earlier you submit, the better. All right, and I also created the submission folder for that, the term paper submission. Okay, now if you happen to miss the deadline, okay, the folder is, is already closed, okay, and you missed the deadline, then I have one more additional folder, which is the late folder submission. Okay, so if you want to submit and you miss the deadline, just go ahead. Whether it's term paper or assignment doesn't matter. You just put it inside this folder. All right, so this is just to make sure that I do not uh, miss out any submission. Okay, because sometimes students, once they miss the deadline, they tend to email. All right, and it's very risky uh, thing because it's very easy for us to miss the email. Okay, so putting it inside directly in Luminous, I think, is, is the safest. Okay, so we do not miss out any emails that you have sent, you know, accidentally, and then, you know, you don't get the pass for it. Okay, so you want to make sure that everything is captured. So please submit only through the Luminous. Do not email your, your report or anything to me. Okay, submit all through Luminous. If you miss the deadline for the two main folders, you put in the late folder submission. Okay. Um, yeah, so what you can probably do, uh, I think quite quickly and quite easily is probably the assignment one first. Okay, so that one is something you can quickly do. All right, uh, and then you can start to think about the term paper and start to sort of have a, a mental picture of how your process is going to be like, and then slowly you design it. Okay, so even though you have time, okay, I will, I will strongly encourage you not to uh, delay it too much. Okay, um, if you can do it earlier and submit it, just go ahead and do it. Okay, uh, because the second half, we're going to go into the OS part. And for the OS part, there will also be another assignment there as well. Okay, so I would like uh, you to, you know, possibly finish it up, uh, you know, by maybe week nine or week ten. Okay, and then you submit. So I think it's, it's better that way. Okay, so basically that's all uh, I have to talk about. Okay, so assignment one. Okay, so maybe I'll show that again. The uh, Lab under the labs folder, this lab one is just for practice only. Okay, lab one is only for practice. Okay, for you to get familiarized with the QP speed. 
okay which is the software we're going to use okay so you use that to get familiarized and get comfortable with using the software and then assignment one is here okay so the labs folder is not for submission it's just for practice okay assignment one is the one you need to submit and the term paper Okay, so I will anyway send an announcement as well. Okay, uh, tomorrow just to, to make sure that all these points are clear uh, when you start doing this. Okay, so that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, you can stay back and ask me. All right, if not, thank you very much. Okay, have a good uh, break next week. Okay, and then uh, I will see you all after the break. Okay, so that's all we have. Thank you. I'll see you all after the break. Goodbye.